talked about peers and we've talked about play, what are friends? Well, friends are peers that we form an attachment with. A friend doesn't have to be anything complex. You don't have to make a friendship bracelet or exchange lockets, but a friend is someone that you have a mutual liking with, that you genuinely look forward to seeing again and enjoy spending time with or at least you think you enjoy spending time with them. So some sort of emotional attachment. A difference between a friend and a peer is a peer's around us, but when they come and leave, we don't really notice and we don't really feel anything. Versus with a friend, we will miss them and we will reminisce about our time with them. And friendships can be extremely powerful. We know that the child-parent bond tends to peak during that attachment stage in young infancy, but our attachment to our friends peaks at roughly age 15. That's when peer influence becomes the most important, and that's when having friends and having a good social status tends to be the most influential to us. Now, what's really interesting is how we go about deciding who is our friend changes over our development. When we are preschoolers and up to about the age of five, we develop friends based on similarities. We'll pick friends that are the same gender as us, that have the same haircut as us, that wear the same shirt as us, or whose name starts with the same letter. It's, it's that simple. And friendships can form really fast in preschool. It's the idea of doing parallel or associative play with someone one time, they're your friend. And doing cooperative play, well now you're best friends. Of course, this gets more complex as we get older. By the time we're roughly around the age of eight, we start to not just consider we start to just not consider similarities, but also favorites. And this is the idea that, yeah, maybe you have the same favorite color as your best friend, but they really like skateboarding and you'd rather stay inside and play video games. So maybe you're not really best friends if you don't have anything in common. And so this is the idea that you will start to select people that enjoy doing the same things as you, or at least some of the time. Friends don't have to have everything in common, but they at least need to have some commonalities that they can bond with. By the time we're age 10, it's not just these similar hobbies, but now it's gonna be the kids with similar hobbies with good social skills. The kids that can cooperate, who don't get overly angry or overly jealous all the time. Not all of us will obey this, but most of us will try and be more selective of our friends based on who's not going to hit us or spit on us. And so it's the idea that social skills matter. And by the time we're in adolescence, it's not just the overt social skills, it's also the more covert social skills. It's also the people that have your back, that you can trust, that you can be intimate and emotionally vulnerable with and tell your secrets to. And when you tell them, they're there for you and they support you. The people that you feel are reliable and trustworthy. And as we move on into adulthood, we assume that friendships are pretty much made the same way. We start to filter people out who see things different than us. We like people who are similar, but we like people that we can trust. Now, this being said, not only does friendship vary by age, it also tends to vary by gender. Even when we're in mixed gender groups and kids can form friendship with whoever they like, the majority of girls tend to form friends with other girls and the majority of boys tend to form friends with other boys. So we need to follow how friendship and gender are intertwined. When we look at groups of girls, we tend to find there are some unique differences that exist here as compared with groups of boys. For instance, in friendship groups of girls, there tends to be a more explicit and more intense focus on best friends. This might be because there's more friendship bracelets and lockets to exchange, but it's also because friendships within girls tend to be more hierarchical. Girls have a more rigid structure of who's best friend and second best friend and third best friend with whom. It's the idea that there's only one person at the top in most cases, and if there's a group of three that are all best friends, there might be a lot of jealousy. If there's a newcomer who wants to go to the mall with someone and not everybody's invited, that can spark major drama. Girls, as compared to boys, tend to find themselves in more dyadic play during free time, where they're off in these best friend pairings. And when they are spending time together, there's more face-to-face -face intimate self-disclosure, where people will talk face-to-face -face and talk about their feelings. And we also know girls just tend to express more words than boys in general. In comparison, groups of boys tend to play and make friends a lot more differently. We tend to find that boys tend to engage in large groups where they may not have a best friend and the structure is not so hierarchical. It tends to be more like a centered ring where a lot of guys get together and play sports in one loose group, but if some of them can't make it some of the time and other people fill in or there's someone who wants to play just some days and not others, 
that seems to be okay up until a point. In elementary, in elementary and middle school, boys tend to be far less jealous and far less controlling of their friendship circles than girls. They focus less on intimacy and trust and privacy than girls, and they focus more on picking people to play with based on if they're cooperative and if they're reliable and altruistic. Now, some of this does start to change as boys get into late adolescence and early adulthood. This is where we can see the shift go when they become much more competitive. And this is when there's more focus on things like varsity sports and fraternities, and getting into those inner circles requires intense initiation. And when boys are just spending time one-on-one -on -one with one of their guy friends, they tend to look at each other in the face far less often, if they ever do that at all. They might be more comfortable sitting side by side and playing video games or watching a movie, and the way they talk may be much more brief. But they may also feel like they're being intimate and self-disclosing when they have more short utterances. For instance, two girls that are close friends that need to discuss something might say, I got in a fight with my dad and he just doesn't understand me and I need to talk about this, and that statement might precede an hour-long conversation. Versus two boys that need to talk about it might say, oh, my dad's a jerk. Yup. And that might be the extent of the conversation that validates and fulfills both of the boys. Of course, we also have to talk about what happens in mixed gendered friendships. And this area is genuinely less well studied and less well known, but we are starting to identify a few key things. One of the things we have to understand with mixed gender friendships is it all depends on exactly how they're mixed gendered. For instance, if what's going on, if you are a girl who just happens to be friends with boys and with girls, or you're a boy who happens to be friends with girls and with boys, this tends to be linked with more positivity. You tend to be someone who just has more social skills and you're liked by everyone. This means that you might actually be doing really good and this is not a problem whatsoever. Especially if the mixed gendered friendship circle has lots of boys and lots of girls or plurals of each, then this means that it might be pretty well adjusted. In comparison, if you're in a mixed gender friendship circle because you're rejected by kids of your same gender, if you're a girl who's only friends with boys and you're rejected by the girls, or if you're a boy who's only friends with girls because you're rejected by the boys, this is usually a marker that there's something going on. Maybe you have lower social skills, maybe you are exhibiting gender nonconformity, maybe there's something else happening that might be making more self-esteem issues or more emotional dysregulation issues. There also might be the case that a mixed gendered friendship group is not really mixed gendered in terms of their gender expression. Although their gender identities might be diverse, it might be that they all have similar gender expressions. Perhaps they are all more androgynous and not really masculine nor feminine. Perhaps everyone in the group is very feminine or everyone in the group is very masculine, and that allows them to fit with their gender expression, if not their gender identity. So there's definitely a lot more work needed in this area. Now in terms of the outcomes of friendship, friendship is by large a really positive thing. We talked about with siblings, how having a sibling there provides you with emotional support. That's exactly what friendship does too. It provides you with security and support. And when you're stressed out, you have someone you can go to and talk to. It's also someone you can spend time with and someone you can learn from. When something's going wrong or when you have to resolve conflict, again, exposure to conflict allows us to strengthen our conflict resolution skills. And depending on how you resolve that conflict, it can actually strengthen your peer status. And people may say, oh, you're all right. The way you resolve that, you seem like you can handle pressure. We also know that kids that have more friends tend to do better at school. They tend to show more motivation and more confidence. And realistically, having friends is like a social safety net. It makes you feel protected. And if your family life is not going super well, a good friend or a positive friendship can be a real life changer. That being said, there's some friendships that we should stay away from, and those are really our friends with frenemies. So what is a frenemy? Well, there's lots of different types of definitions for frenemies, but for the purposes of this class, we're gonna talk about frenemies as the friend that you are associated with, that you have an emotional attachment with, and that you try to spend all your time with, but even though you're doing that, it's a really conflictive and unsupportive friendship. A frenemy situation might go in both directions or might just go in one direction. We might have one person who praises the ground the other friend walks on, and the second friend is really mean in return. Or you might have two friends that are both really bullheaded and toxic to each other. But whatever's going on, frenemies tend to be characterized by an insecure attachment. 
In fact, people who were insecurely attached when they were infants tend to more likely find themselves in a frenemy situation. Also, children of more controlling, authoritarian parents tend to be more likely to find them as having a frenemy. We also know that kids that struggle to deal with their stress and who have lower self-esteem will put up with a toxic friendship for longer and more often. And this does not lead to good outcomes. Having a frenemy tends to lead to disengagement in school and kids tend to be more disruptive and more delinquent. So it's all around not a good thing. And if you're putting up with a friend, even though you're getting nothing out of the friendship anymore, it might be time to cut your losses. Now when we talk about friends, one of the big negatives a lot of parents have been worried about for every generation is the notion of pressure or peer pressure. Peer pressure is called peer pressure rather than friend pressure because it can come just from peers, but it most often will come from our friends and the people we value the feedback from the most. And we tend to be most concerned about the bad pressure. This is the pressure to do drugs, to engage in sexual activity before we're emotionally ready, and the idea to steal or skip school or what have you. The good news is bad pressure is the least common. We're least likely to endure it. And it doesn't stay constant. It tends to peak right around age 15. That's right, the time where friends become the most influential. And so it goes down after that. It seems to be more fleeting. Some kids do get wrapped up in bad groups and peer pressure will take a more toxic form for them in a more salient and potent way. For the majority of us, this maladaptive peer pressure tends to be more fleeting and more temporary right around middle adolescence. Luckily, good peer pressure or adaptive peer pressure is much more common. And this is things like having a friend encourage you to study, encouraging you to apply to university or joining a volunteer group or doing something really nice for your community or taking a shower. And so good peer pressure tends to be more prevalent. But the most prevalent type of peer pressure is not good or bad. It's really the trivial, the benign peer pressure. This is the stuff that's not gonna change your life like going to college or dropping out of school. It's the stuff that's kind of small. It's the stuff like, what are you gonna wear? Or what are you gonna have for lunch? And the reason why these items are more common is because they really don't matter. We are more likely to take someone's advice and decide what we're going to wear to the mall or what we're going to eat for lunch or at the university food court because there's not a big deal associated with it. Now what's interesting is some things that are trivial to some families may be a big deal. Like if you're observing certain religious dietary preferences or certain types of religious garments, for instance. And so trivial peer pressure tends to be the things that we don't have other guidance on. What I mean by this is if you have guidance from your parents, from the law, from your school, or from your religion about certain things, like what you should eat, what you should wear, what your hobby should be, how you should talk, then you tend to be resilient to the peer pressure on those things. If you have a religious observation that you won't do something, peer pressure tends to not work on you. Versus if your parents haven't talked to you about certain topics in your school and your religion and there's no legal enforcement about it, then you will be more likely to cave from peer pressure. And that's why it's important for families to talk to their kids about things like internet safety and, or sex and development, or if it's putting on a helmet when you go bike riding, it's important because as soon as we have that guidance, we become much more immune to our peer pressure. 